from Jerusalem to Babylon. Welcome to another lesson from the book of Daniel. The prophet could stood out not only for his prophecies, but also for his stories of faith and dedication to God's work in difficult times. Today we will study the first chapter of the book that begins with that defeat and culminates with a very significant spiritual victory for Daniel and his companions. The defeat has to do with the capitulation of the kingdom of Judah and the deportation of a large number of people to Babylon. The victory has to do with a certain kind of independence they were able to gain in the midst of the court of Babylon. They could keep their faith without hurting the king's pagan sensibility. The history begins with the siege of Jerusalem by the king of Babylon. This happened in the third year of King Jehoiakim. Since prophet Jeremiah affirms that this happened in the fourth year of that king of Judah, Many critics have concluded that this was one of the many mistakes presumed to be found in the book of Daniel. During the development of the different lessons, we will see how archaeology has proven the authenticity of the stories of the book of Daniel. Edwin Thiel, a Seventh-day Adventist scholar, synchronized the historical days of the kings of Israel acknowledging that there were two methods used to count the years of their reigns. More than half a century later, his studies are still generally recognized as the ultimate authority on the subject. Thiel informs us that in Judah they used to compute the reigns of kings beginning with the new year while in Babylon they did so from the time when the new king ascended to the throne, before the new year. The Babylonian Chronicles of the Chaldean Kings, published by Professor D. J. Weisman in 1956, confirmed that alternative Babylonian method of counting the years of the kings. Since Daniel was in Babylon, he could have used the reckoning system employed there. The king of Babylon commanded to bring him the best men of the kingdom of Judah from that first deportation. His purpose was to convert them to his gods to cooperate in the aggrandizement of his kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar did not know that through Daniel and his companions, he himself would be converted to the religion of the God he assumed he had defeated. How many times has that same principle been repeated in history? The fidelity of God's humble children who were for non-believers often ends up converting their patrons to the God of the Bible. And those who come with the intention of converting us to their faith end up admiring our message and embracing it with all their heart. In his attempt to convert the young Hebrews, the king replaced the names that related them to the God of Israel with others that associated them with the Babylonian gods. The meaning of their original Hebrew names centered on the one true God. El meant God, and Yah is an abbreviation of Yahweh, the Eternal. Thus, Daniel means God is my judge. Ananiah means Yah has been gracious. Mishael means who is what God is. Azariah, Yah has helped. But the chief official gave them new names related to the god Aku, the moon god, to the god Nebo or Nabu, or to the god Nergal. Thus, Shadrach's name seems to be derived from Shudur Aku, command of Aku. 
Meshach is probably a variation of Mi Sha Aku, meaning who is as Aku is. And Abednego is either servant of the god Nebo, Nabu, or a variation of Abedr, Abedr Nergal, servant of the god Nergal. I imagine how the Israelites must have felt with names that honored ridiculous gods like those worshipped by the Babylonians, as can be seen in the Chaldean records that archaeology has brought to light. For example, one of those legends refers to a fight between the older gods and the younger gods because the latter made a lot of noise. The older ones sought peace and quiet, which brought wars until they met Marduk, who accepted the challenge of defending them on condition of being nominated as head of the Pantheon. Marduk defeated his opponent Tiamat, and with his corpse he planned the cosmos, where the stars and constellations appeared, the moon and probably the sun. Thus, Marduk reorganized the divine kingdom and was proclaimed king of the gods. Man was created so that the gods would not have to work. He killed Kingu, Tiamat's partner, and his blood was used to form man. Babylon is the first city to be built. The documents issue a call to praise Marduk. When I was introduced to the pastoral ministry, I decided to study the Bible verse, verse by verse, and I remember that one of the issues that called my attention was that in the conquests of Canaan, God commanded the Israelites to change the name of some of the cities they conquered. The goal was clear. The memory of the ancient gods and their pagan practices had to be eradicated. But I found that Later in Israel's history, some old names prevailed over the new names. Evidently, groups of people experienced struggles similar to that of individuals who, as the Apostle Paul explains, have to change their spiritual nature from an old man or old nature to a new man or new nature. This is a study that I will revisit in the future. In the case of the young Hebrews, it was clear that the king wanted to make them forget the supposed little god they had, to honor them with the gods of the mighty kings of Babylon. But as we will see in another lesson, one of them is mentioned by his original Hebrew name on a Babylonian tablet which contains the names of these young men who were required to pledge allegiance to King Nebuchadnezzar. Let me tell you something. The world may label us with derogatory names, and we must be patient when this happens, like the Hebrew young man. But the Lord will vindicate us and give us his name. As a matter of fact, he promises to give us a new name that will never be taken from us. Revelation 2 verse 17. The first test had to do with the food. In the food provided for the king's table were swine's flesh and other meals which were pronounced unclean by the law given through Moses, wrote Ellen G. White. Added to this was the fermented wine that the king put on his table, which would cause them to lose their spiritual discernment. They could recall the experience of Nadab and Abu, and to complete the picture, the king and his people offered those sacrifices to their gods, asking them for their blessing. Therefore, in their fidelity to the true God, Daniel and his companions decided not to become contaminated with the king's food. By asking to eat only vegetables and drink water instead of wine, the humble Hebrew captives were not insolent or critical of how the heathen ate, but prudent, wise, 
and respectful. They asked to be given the opportunity to try their unrestricted diet for 10 days, which was enough to show that they would not weaken themselves, but on the contrary, they would be as strong as or stronger than the others. And God rewarded the faithfulness of his servants by giving them a better appearance than those of others who served from the king's table. Today we live in the midst of spiritual Babylon, and God calls his people to be faithful also with the laws of health, even when it comes to meals. The diet of God's people is also different today, and we should not be ashamed of it. We see the advantage today as more and more athletes are becoming vegetarians and even vegans without lust of performance. Whenever you turn to the original Eden diet, the positive results appear. And although God permitted clean meats after the flood, at a time like ours it is less risky to eat only legumes. We will speak more on this issue in our commentary on Daniel chapter 10. Let us hear the manner of reckoning found in Daniel for the time required by Nebuchadnezzar to instruct the captives in his plan to assimilate them into his kingdom. Verse 5 says it should have been for three years, but in verse 18 it says that at the end of the days set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to the king. We see here in the first chapter the principle of reckoning a day for a year. It was normal for Jews to refer to years by the term days, something that in apocalyptic passages always applies. Let us look, for example, at Genesis 5, verse 5. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years. All the days of Seth were 912 years, verse 8. Our days may come to 70 years, Psalm 90, verse 10, etc. During these three years, the four young Jews studied the Chaldean language and all the sciences developed by the Babylonians without neglecting communion with God. In other words, they were not young fanatics who did not want to dialogue with people of another faith, but sought to prepare to give greater service to the government which they were under and to be better able to share their faith at the highest levels of the kingdom. No doubt there were other young Hebrews, as well as promising young men from other nations in the king's three-year program. But the prize for greater intellectual development is obtained by those who consecrate themselves to God to study his word and develop an entrepreneurial spirit of overcoming to give God and society the best service they can give. A while back, a young German Adventist who also spoke French went to the University of Strasbourg where I received a doctorate in theology a number of years ago. One of the theology professors told him that several Seventh-day Adventist pastors had studied with that Protestant faculty. Some had lost their faith. Others came out with their faith strengthened. So, in his view, the final outcome of that education depends on the purpose and attitude of those who enter the university. Having studied there, I can say that much depends on the training one receives before going to the university, and their objective for studying at those centers of intellectual criticism. I could see, indeed, that some came with the intention of proving that their church was wrong, 
and the result was quite predictable. When called to teach on the basis of the title they obtained, they then sow seeds of thought that contradict the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist faith. So where's the problem? Largely in pre-college preparation. When you go to a university without thorough grasp of the truth that God has entrusted to his people and you neglect communion with God, the risk of departure from the mission he entrusted to us is greater. Moses was educated by his mother until he was old enough to follow his studies at the Pharaoh's court. And yet, the university education he received, so useful in later becoming the legislator and leader of his people, affected him in his spiritual life. That is why God took him to the wilderness where he re-educated him in the spiritual school of the Lord. The education of Saul of Tarsus was very useful for his later work as the apostle of the Gentiles. But as Moses, he had to spend three years in the Arabian desert to relearn many things in the light of divine revelation. No doubt. Daniel and his companions had been educated in the word of the Lord in Jerusalem and kept their communion with God alive. I remember when the first Argentinian general to lead a squadron to the South Pole came to our high school and superior college in Argentina. When he stood before the youth of our school, he stared for more than a minute without speaking. More than one of us wondered what was wrong with him. He finally said the following. There are two moments when I felt myself in God's presence. The first time was when I arrived at the South Pole with my soldiers. The second is now as I look into the faces of these young people. I have been going to many schools and colleges around the country with the story of our expedition, but faces like these are not seen elsewhere. The spirit of prophecy says, if all would make the Bible their study, we should see a people further developed capable of thinking more deeply and showing a greater degree of intelligence than the most earnest efforts in studying merely the science and histories of the world could make them. The Bible gives the true seeker for truth an advanced mental discipline, and he comes from contemplation of divine things with his faculties enriched, self is humbled, while God and his revealed truth are exalted. She wrote this in 1892. He who gives the scriptures close, prayerful attention will gain clear comprehension and sound judgment, as if in turning to God he had reached a higher plane of intelligence. Think for a moment of the contrast between an intelligent Christian and a man who is living for self, a votary of sin. There stand two men endowed with equal capabilities. Their opportunities have been the same. The same inducements have been presented before them. One has studied his Bible with the purpose to make it the rule of his life. He knows the source of his strength and trusts in the merits of Jesus hanging his helpless soul upon his mercy. His life is one of self-denial. He does not live to please himself, but it is his pleasure to be a collaborator with God. His countenance is lighted up with intelligence. His experience is rich and deep. His bearing is that of a Christian gentleman, calm, 
self-possessed and dignified. Now, look at the opposite picture, continues writing Ellen G. White. There stands one to whom God has entrusted precious talents. He is familiar with the scriptures, but his heart has never been sanctified through the truths they teach. His affections have never been entwined about God. But unlike the vine trailing upon the ground, its tendrils grasping the stumps and rubbish of earth. His entire character is marked by a littleness and earthliness, a debasement, which testifies to those who observe his ways that the spirit of truth has not entered the inner sanctuary of the soul and cleansed it of its defilement. Surely no one can hesitate to choose between these two representative characters, continues writing the spirit of prophecy. But let each one remember that refinement and true nobility are qualities that never come by chance. It is only by individual, personal effort, added by the grace of God, that a high standard of moral excellence can be reached.